Good morning, church. We would like to wish you a happy Easter and remind you that Jesus Christ is not dead. He is alive. We're going to invite you to sing out this morning. Oh, shame is in prison, as cruel as in grave. Shame is in robber, and he's come to take my name. Oh, love is in my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is a power where my freedom song is found. Hear that drum sound. 
Friends, welcome to Foundation Church and happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Uh, what a great day to be joining us online everywhere. Thank you so much for being here. If this is your first Sunday, your second Sunday, your third Sunday, your, your hundredth Sunday with us, go ahead and comment below. Let us know you're here and, and perhaps give us a little He is risen. Uh, we realize this is probably an Easter unlike any Easter any of us have experienced before. But maybe, just maybe this Easter is a lot closer in many ways to that very first Easter. So I'm going to invite you to embrace that today. Now, normally this is the place where we have the kids do something cool. We would bring them up probably, honestly, we would do an egg hunt with the kids here today. But we're not doing that. Instead, I'm going to have all the kids as loud as you can yell, He is risen. Get ready. One, two, three. He is risen. Hallelujah, death has lost. 
lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. And came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion. No claim on me. Then came the morning. Let's hear the promise. Your very body begin to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no
the precious blood that my Jesus spilt. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid. Salve! Hey.
we've come to the part of our service where we have the privilege to talk to God, to talk to God about whatever's going on in our lives, good things, bad things, in between things. I, I know some of, some of us feel like, hey, we can only talk to God in church, but friends, that's not true. God is here with you. Uh, he's here with us. He's everywhere and longs to hear from you and to speak with you. So I'm going to, in just a moment, invite you to pray silently about whatever's going on in your life. At the end of that silent prayer, I'm going to actually lift up the Lord's Prayer. If that's a new prayer for you, we'll put the words right on the screen for you. So feel free to open your eyes and pray that. Uh, with that instruction given, friends, I'm going to invite you to join me in prayer now. God, no matter where we are today, may we know your presence, may we feel your peace, may we revel in that victory, that victory that you give to us. Lord God, hear our prayers as now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus is risen. He is alive. The stone was rolled away. Friends, happy Easter, and thank you so much for joining us here online everywhere today. We are continuing this series, Journeying with Jesus, one that we began several weeks ago. We followed Jesus all over into Jerusalem to the very foot of the cross, and now today we get to follow him into resurrection and victory over sin and death. Amen. Uh, I have to be honest, though. I have to bring it down a little bit. I apologize. Um, I am like the world's biggest optimist. I mean, if there was one drop of water in a cup, I would tell you it was half full. Maybe I would even dare say it was three quarters full. Like, that's the way I roll. And yet the reality is this week, this has been a little bit of a rough week for me. There have been more than a few times where I found myself feeling pretty down. And I think... I think I'm not alone in this. And so I want to ask you, and I'm going to invite you to go ahead and comment down below. I want to ask you, what's got you down this week? What is it in your life, in this world, that's bringing you down or has brought you down this week? Now, it could be all that's going on with the coronavirus, with COVID-19, with the numbers that continue to go up, and with the scary stories that we hear from all around our country and our world. Maybe it's being out of work. Maybe it's the kids being out of school. Maybe it's this whole quarantine, shelter in place, whatever language your, your state, your area is using or you choose to use. This notion that we can't go anywhere. We can't get out. Uh, and for many of us, we feel a little unsafe if we are getting out. Perhaps there's something entirely different going on in your life. But I have to be honest, for me, it's not any specific thing. It's not any one of these things necessarily. But rather, it's this idea that as people, we have this tendency to gravitate toward, to remember, and even, dare I say, to dwell on the negative. The negative narratives seem to win and to rule the day. If you turn on the news, it's there. If you go and open up your computer, it's there. If you pop up your phone, it's there. It seems like as people, we, 
we focus in on the negative. And I know I can already hear some of you saying, look, John, the negative in this world right now, the negative in my life in this moment is literally a two-ton boulder. I can't see around it. I can't see through it. All I can see is the negative. Well, I've got some good news for you today because we serve and we are here to celebrate a God whose specialty is two-ton boulders. A God who loves to remove those obstacles from our path so that not only can we draw closer to him, but so that we can have more faith, so we can believe more fully each and every day. That's the kind of a story that we're reading today as we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. Now that story that I'm going to be reading to you in a minute, it comes from Luke's gospel. I'm going to be reading Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. There are two important things, though, that I want to highlight for you first. The first one, and this may be obvious to some of you, is that this story takes place after Jesus has died, after his crucifixion. Now that happened on Friday, what many Christians call Good Friday. If that's a story that you're unfamiliar with or if it's a story you haven't heard in a long time, we put up a video Friday evening that tells that story in an incredibly powerful, rather dramatic way. Uh, and it does it in about eight minutes. And so after this service, I would invite you, if you're curious about that, to just scroll a little further down our Facebook page and check that video out to hear that story told in, in kind of a new way. Um, the other important thing to understand is that Jesus' crucifixion occurred the day before the Sabbath. And what this means is that for Jews, it was literally against the law for them to do any work on the Sabbath. And so when Jesus died, he was kind of hastily, his body was put into a tomb, but it was a temporary thing. Nobody did anything during the Sabbath, and our story picks up on the very next day, very early the morning after. Uh, and that's where we're going to read as the women are coming to, to prepare Jesus' body for his final burial. Again, I'm reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering, wondering to himself what had happened. This is God's word. It's given freely for each and every one of you. So I want to go back to verse 2. In verse 2, we have maybe the key to this entire passage, to this entire story, or at least the key for us today. The stone had been rolled away. The stone was rolled away. Now, you heard me earlier talking about big boulders, two-ton boulders, the stone that covered Jesus' tomb likely was one to two tons in weight. It was a stone that would have taken more than a couple people to move, and it was designed to keep people out of the tomb, to keep grave robbers from coming in, right? This stone, though, it was rolled away not to keep people out. It was rolled away so people could see in, right? It wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. It was rolled away so the women and the others could see what had happened. If we move on to verse 11, we have these women going back to the disciples, going back and reporting what they had seen, what they had been told by these two men in dazzling white clothes, these angels. And the women share this story, and we're told that the disciples, to them, it sounded like nonsense, absolute nonsense. And because of that, they didn't believe. 
Now, this, before we're too harsh on the disciples, this isn't that crazy of a thing, right? How many of you have experienced a resurrection? Yeah, I'll wait for you to raise your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, that's right. None of us. This had never happened before. It has not happened since. This was unusual. The other thing is the disciples, whether they were at the cross, whether they watched from a distance, or whether they had already scattered and were long gone, each and every one of them knew a crucifixion meant. This was not an uncommon means of killing people in the ancient world. This was known to them. They knew the gross, gruesome and gory details. And so they knew there was no hope. So maybe history looks on them and says, hey, these guys, they should have believed a little more. But the reality is that I think most rational humans would respond just the way they did. Now, if we move on, we get to uh, verse 12. And in verse 12, we have Peter. Peter is the example, oftentimes, of the disciples in the Gospels. In this instance, he's like a step above, right? Most of the disciples say we don't believe it, it's nonsense, and yet we're told that Peter runs to the tomb. That word for run there, it's not like a slow jog. It's not like, hey, he's going to run a marathon. This is a sprint. He is full out sprinting to the tomb. And then when he gets there, we're told that he looks and he wonders what's happened. Peter doesn't know what to make of it. He doesn't know what to do about all of this. Uh, He is awestruck, and dare I say, even a little dumbstruck at what what he's experiencing, what he's witnessing, uh, what he's seeing. So let's go back to that idea of the stone being rolled away. You heard me say that this wasn't rolled away for Jesus to get out, but rather it was rolled away so people could see in. Now, the truth is that we have three main groups of people that we're talking about today. We have the women, right? The women who went in and experienced it and then went out and told others because they believed. They believed what they were told. We have most of the disciples who were told what happened and said, I don't believe this. It's nonsense. And then the third is Peter. We have Peter who ran to see and upon seeing didn't know what to make, right? Maybe he wanted to believe. Maybe there was a little bit of doubt going on there. Three groups, the women, the disciples, and Peter. And I want you to ask yourselves, as a matter of fact, I I don't only want you to ask yourselves, I want you to go ahead and comment below, which one of these three do you want to be like? Do you want to be the one who believes, who's told and believes? Do you want to be the one who absolutely dismisses it and says that's nonsense? Or do you want to be like Peter, the one who says, I don't know, I'm not sure. I I wish I could believe, but I don't know. Uh, Go ahead and comment that below. The reality is I think most of us want to be the ones who believe, right? We want to be like the women. We want to believe. Now, the reality is also most of us have those moments, those times where we struggle to believe, where if we're not like the disciples, full on saying, this is nonsense, I reject it, we're at least like Peter, where we say, I don't know. I wish I could believe, but I just don't know what to make of it. And that's okay. I want to say to you really clearly here and now that faith isn't faith if there isn't some component of doubt involved, right? If you know for certain, that's not called faith. That's called knowledge. And so if you have doubt, that's okay. What I want to help you with today is maybe removing some of that doubt. I can't help but think about a friend of mine who used to say to me, John, I really, really want to believe this whole Jesus, God, church thing that you're doing but it's hard for me. And whenever he would say that to me, I couldn't help but think of this other character in your Bible. This comes from Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 9, where there was a father who wanted his son to be healed. He brought his son to Jesus, and in verse 24, this father says to Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. And that's, that's where most of us find ourselves, right? We believe to an extent. We want to believe, and yet we need some help with our unbelief. Well, today we're going to talk about that. I'm I'm going to tell you about that by first telling you a story about my family checking out fall leaves. I realize it's springtime. I know that. But what we've been doing as a family lately, although maybe this isn't okay, what we've been doing is we've been trying to go for car rides, take the kids out to see things. And one of those times that we were out for a car ride, we were taking the kids out just to get out of the house— I couldn't help but think back to when my children were much younger. And in the fall, we would especially drive them around to see the leaves changing colors. And for part of that time, we lived in the Adirondacks where the leaves turn like even a more brilliant uh, set of colors than they do here 
in upstate New York. And so as we were driving around one particular time, you know, I was commenting, and my wife Crystal was commenting, and our oldest Emily was commenting, and our youngest Gideon was commenting how beautiful the leaves were and all the different shapes and colors and shades. And our middle daughter, Hannah, she wasn't very old, maybe five or six at this point, but our middle daughter, Hannah, didn't seem very impressed. As a matter of fact, she said, I don't know what's so great about this. They don't look that great to me. I just want to go home. Now, at the, at the time, I chalked it up to my daughter being a little cranky, maybe a little tired, maybe a little hungry, and I thought, well, it's, it is what it is. She's a kid. Now, fast forward several years. My family's moved to Vestal, New York, and, and we, we're established here. Like, Foundation Church is a thing. We're living here. My kids are in school, and we meet Dan Kirchheimer. If you don't know, Dan is an eye doctor. I don't, I don't know what his specific title is. I always mess it up. Uh, but Dan is a doctor of the eyes. <laughs> and Dan said to us, we, we were talking to him, we were, we were sharing his story, and we said, hey, you know, Hannah couldn't read the menu at Five Guys the other day. She couldn't read, like, the letters. Should we take her in? Because she's never had any problems with the doctors or in school. They've never said that she has eye problems. But maybe she does. And Dan said, yeah, let let me take a look at her, bring her into the office, and lo and behold, it turns out our middle daughter, Hannah, in like fifth grade, <laughs> had to get glasses. Uh, it turned out for that long in her life, what she saw and what the rest of us saw were two totally different things. Now, after she got her glasses, we were driving in the car one fall morning. I was taking Hannah to school, and she was staring intently out the window. And I asked her, what are you doing? What are you, what are you looking at? And she said, the leaves. And I said, yeah, there's leaves on the trees. And yep, you're right. They're like orange and yellow and red. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And she said, I've never seen them before. <laughs> now, I have to be honest, it made me feel like just the worst dad ever that my sixth grader had never experienced leaves on trees in fall colors before, or at least not in the same way that I had. But I am incredibly grateful that D Dr. Kirchheimer was willing to take a look at her eyes and then to help us diagnose what was the problem, right? There was this very profound obstacle in her vision keeping her from seeing the world the way the rest of us saw it. I'm going to suggest to you today that just like Hannah couldn't see those leaves clearly until she got glasses, many of us are struggling, whether it's with negativity or doubt or something entirely different things in our lives that are serving as obstacles that keep us from seeing the glory of this day, of the resurrection, of the fact that Jesus is alive, that he has defeated death, and that that means that for each and every one of us, sin and death no longer hold any power. That's the same kind of thing, right? The stone has been rolled away, not for Jesus' benefit, but for our benefit. And so I want to ask you at this point this question. What obstacles to faith do you need removed today? What things are in your way in your life keeping you from seeing the fullness of the good news that is Jesus is risen? He's risen indeed. Now, it could be that the obstacle for you is fear, right? Maybe you're afraid of being wrong if you believe. Maybe you're afraid of being a fool. Maybe you're afraid of where this faith is going to take you if you fully believe, if you fully accept, if you fully go with where God is leading you. Perhaps, and this one breaks my heart, perhaps the obstacle to you fully believing, to your faith growing, is the church. Maybe you've had an experience with a church where you were hurt, where you were misled, or maybe you just experienced a church that was so confusing that you got frustrated and gave up with it. First and foremost, I want to apologize. On behalf of all Christians and all the church, I want to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry that your experience was that. But I also want to say that, man, we've got a God who wants to move that boulder away. Perhaps the obstacle to your belief today is a person. Maybe it's somebody that you've encountered way long ago in your past or who you still encounter each and every day today. And for you, that person is a living embodiment of Jesus of God, of faith. And because of that, you've said, I want nothing to do with that. 
Again, I don't know what those obstacles are for you. I don't know what those boulders look like. I do know that they are big, two tons, and they are blocking out everything. But I also know that when they are removed, the life that you can have, the faith that you can enjoy, is greater than you can imagine. You don't know what you don't know until you finally know. So with all of that in mind, I want to encourage you today. Jesus rolled that stone away 2,000 years ago so that those first followers could see in. They could see the miracle of the resurrection. Today, Jesus longs to roll that stone away for you. He longs to be in relationship with you that you might celebrate with him. Friends, I'm going to invite you to join me in prayer. God, we give you thanks. Jesus is alive. He is risen. And this stone has been rolled away. Lord, we believe. We want to believe. Help us where we still yet have unbelief. God, help us to trust in you. Help us to ask you to roll those boulders away for us, those obstacles out of our path that we might be drawn closer to you. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So in just a moment, our worship team is going to lead you in one final song today. That last song is going to be awesome. It's going to give you one last chance to celebrate, to praise, to rejoice in what God has done and to have hope for what God longs to do in and through each and every one of us. While that's happening, I'm going to invite you to give back to God some portion of your tithes, your gifts, and your offerings, some portion of your money toward Foundation Church that we might continue to do the ministry in and through this world that God has called us to. Now, look, we're going to put a link right down below in the comments for you to click on to easily give online. You can also go ahead and mail in a check if you want to do it that way. Uh, that, that works as well. I do want to say really clearly, though, if this is your first, your second, or your third time with us, we don't want a gift from you. We don't want money from you. We just want to get to know you. This is a great time, if you haven't already, to go ahead and comment below and say, hey, I'm here for the third time, or I'm here for the second time, or I'm here for the first time. I, I got to be honest, if, if you've been here a hundred times and you've never once commented, go ahead and comment down below, I'm here for the hundredth time. We'll be just as excited to have you join us. With that instruction given, friends, I'm going to turn it over to the worship team and invite you to praise what the Lord has done. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. When through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. Finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? Who heart could fathom such boundless? Of glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. 
Friends, this service was incredible today. Hopefully you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed being with you. Uh, in just a minute, I'm going to give you some good words to take you out. But before I do that, I want to invite you to come on back next week and let you know what we're going to be doing. We're going to actually continue the, the kind of the last part of this Journeying with Jesus series. Uh, but we're going to invite you all to wear your pajamas. As a matter of fact, we're all going to wear our pajamas next week as well. Uh, with that said, receive these words of blessing and benediction. May you go forth with the risen Lord, the one who has defeated death, the one who gives us hope in the midst of life. May you go with Christ and go in his peace. Amen.